1 John chapter 3. In the New Testament, the book is 1 John, the chapter 3, verses 10 through 15 is where we are tonight. 1 John chapter 3, verses 10 through 15. John ends verse number 9 by saying to us, whoever has been born of God does not sin. And we discovered on last week that this is talking about a practice of sin. Sin that is done over and over again. A lifestyle of sin. But we all realize that we are sinners, right? Yeah. We realize that even though we have received Jesus Christ as our Savior, we are still sinners. And we like to say we're sinners saved by grace. And even during our saved period, we have sin in us, around us, through us, with us, right? So we, uh, we have to understand that John is talking about those who have made a practice of sin. Now, if you have made a practice of sin, then you better check yourself. You, if you can sin without the Holy Spirit convicting you, you have a problem not even think about it, you have a problem. If you can sin and continue in sin and keep going on in sin, not confess your sin, not repent of your sin, then you have a problem. And it's more than Houston that has a problem. He says there's a seed in us. We're born of God. And because we're born of God, then we ought not make a habit. It must not be habitual sin. It must not be a habit of sin. It must not be a constant practice of sin. Because folk who love the Lord, people who, who are walking with him, people who are on the Lord's side, they do not practice sin. My, my, my. They don't practice sin. Last week we talked about rebellion. We talked about open rebellion and silent rebellion. People who are walking with God do not practice rebellion, whether it's in secret or whether it's openly. We don't practice rebellion. So verse 10 says, in this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. This word manifest means to be made visible, to be revealed, to, to be uh, shown, to, to be visualized. So this word manifest says here, John says here that you have those who are of God revealed and those who are of the devil revealed. <laughs> Michelle Obama says it well. She said the presidency does not make you who you are. It reveals who you are. If you have character, you're going to have character regardless of what office you hold. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. It shows. People see it. You can see it. But will you really stop long enough to deal with it and allow the Lord to deal with it? So the children of God and the devil of God is revealed. Whosoever or whoever does not practice righteousness it is not of God. There's the word practice again. This means it's a habit. You ought to make it a habit. It ought to be a custom. It ought to be a part of your life to walk with God, to practice righteousness. Because he says, those who do not practice righteousness, they are not of God. And we like to believe that we are of God, right? Yes, right. We like to say we are of God. We like to reveal and be manifest as we of God. So we have to understand that if we do not practice righteousness, it's not of God. Isn't it? Hmm. And we are not of God. Nor is he who does not love his brother, nor is he not of God. Nor, this negative, neither he who practice unrighteousness, he who practice those things that are not righteous, those people are not of God. 
And then he moves from the practice. He moves to talk about love, this agape love, this God-type love, this, this love that we can only get from God, this love we can only receive from God. William Clark says in his Facebook post, William T. Clark Jr. of Belzona, Mississippi, says in his Facebook post that we just throw this word love around. <laughs> we just throw it around any kind of way. We love our new car. We love our food. We, we, we love our new house. We love your new dress and your shoes and your purse. Girl, I really love what you wear. He says, but the love that God has to offer is not limited to a purse, a hat, or clothes. Mm. The love that God has for us ought to be carried over to the love for the brother and for the sister. So John moves to this idea of loving your brother. Who is your brother? Brother Whitlock, you have a brother? That's a loaded question. <laughs> so what now? Okay, you do not have a biological brother. Do you have a brother? Name one of your brothers. I see. <laughs> okay, so we have to love each other, right? We have to love our brothers. We have to love our sisters. This is the Christ way. I wrote a piece. I finished it today. It's called The Culture of Christ. In this piece that is going in somebody else's book, an essay that's going in, in Dr. Marshall Lee's book, I talked about the fact that there's a culture, that Christ stands, and that Christ believes in, and that Christ delivers, and that Christ has shown. It is genuine love. I told you several times that people know when you're really faking it. Mm -hmm. they, they're not talking about it. They're not saying anything when it's not genuine love. They know when you're just putting up with them. They know that when you're just going par for the course because you're in church. Yeah. They, they know. We, before COVID, we had fellowship period, and in the fellowship period, were you exemplifying love? Were you, were you really genuinely loving? Deep down in your heart, were you really loving? Or were you just appearing to love? Just want to show love? Or, or you want people to think you're loving? This agape type of love that Jesus has, this culture of love that Jesus has presented to us, is something we ought to follow. Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Yeah, I love you. Well, feed my sheep. Do you love me? Yeah, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my lamb. Yeah. Do you love me? It's a wonder Peter didn't start cussing after he asked me the third time. You know, Peter, Peter got that, that cussing spirit in him. He said, yeah, Lord, I love you. Why do you keep asking me this? He said, well, if you love me, feed my sheep. You have to show love for the brother. So much so, until you agonize when they agonize. You suffer when they suffer. You go through what they go through. Even if you don't know the whole story, you struggle with them. So, John says, if we don't show love for the brethren, we're walking in unrighteousness. We're not of God. God won't be a part of us. It's dealing with the practice. We ought to practice love. Matter of fact, we ought to look for people to show love toward. We have a watching world looking at us, a watching world seeing us, and this watching world is looking to see if Christians or Christians really, really showing love. So we ought to show Verse, verse, verse number 11. But this is the message that you heard from the beginning. In other words, not a new message. This is not a new commandment. This is the same message you've been hearing. This is the same, same old soup. 
Not even one note. It's the same old suit. Same thing that you've been, been hearing from day one. Let me tell you, the church ought to be an organism that's showing love. Regardless of your personality, regardless if you're an introvert or an extrovert, you ought to show love. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should love one another. We ought to love one another. I'm not talking about just hugging love. I'm not talking about loving somebody that when you when you when they give you something, loving somebody when they do what you say for them to do. I uh, I watched American Got Talent, and when a person get voted to go father. Guess what? Oh, I love you all. When they don't get voted to go father, they don't say anything about love. Oh, I just love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. But we have to understand love, God type love, is not dependent on whether we receive what we want. It's not dependent on whether we, we get what we ask for. It's all dependent on a heart. Let's look at look at what he says. He says, this is the same thing you've been hearing from the beginning, that you ought to love one another. Jesus says it like this. They will know. People will know. They will know that you are my disciples based on your love for one another. Let me tell you that this, the, the, the drug addicts love each other. The, the winos love each other. And they show love for each other. If one of them get in trouble, they don't talk about them, they go to their rescue. Prostitutes hang out and they love each other. It's the church that shoots their own wounded. It's the church that does not pick them up as Jesus describes. Pick them up as a lamb and lay them on his shoulder and nourish them back to health. It's the church. That's why at our church we have brothers keep us, sister keep us. Somebody fall into hard times, we look out for them because we want to show love toward one another. Verse 12. He talks about love by telling us what love is not. <laughs> he introduces us to this guy named Cain. He talks about love and he bags into it by showing us what love is not. Look at what he says. He says, he says, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one. Not as Cain, who was of the devil. Not as Cain, who was of Satan. Not as Cain, who was of Lucifer. He says, we all love one another. And then he says, love is not being like Cain. Says to us that we need to know beyond a shadow of doubt, we're not like Cain, who was of the wicked one, of the devil, and murdered his brother. Is murder of God or of the devil? Yes? No? Maybe so? Murder. So, so he murders his brother. He, he's not of God. He's of the devil. He's of the wicked one. He actually murdered his brother. Murder is not of God. He says, if you're going to exemplify love, if you're going to manifest love, if you're going to show forth love, you can't act like Cain. <laughs> Who murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were easy, they were evil, and his brothers righteous. Seemed like they had some. Seemed like Cain had some jealousy there. God accepted Cain's, accepted Abel's gift, did not accept Cain's gift. He rejected Cain's gift. And you know, excellence shines a spotlight on mediocrity. 
You see, people know that they're mediocre when they stand next to excellence. They don't like you because you're showing forth excellence. And because they are not showing forth excellence. And when you're not showing forth, when one is not showing forth excellence, and then you show forth excellence, jealousy creeps in, envy creeps in. And in this case, it led to murder. It really, really, really led to murder. See, murder begins in the heart. You, you contemplate it in your heart. After you contemplate it in your heart, you, you play with it in your mind. After you play with it in your mind, you begin to yield to that temptation. That's why when a person murders somebody in the heat of of the moment, they are not dealt with as severely as premeditated murder. When you premeditate it, that means while you're on your way, the Lord tried to stop you, <laughs> tried to talk to you, and you ignored him. One guy drove 300 miles. One woman drove more than 300 miles to kill somebody. Couldn't, I mean, you had to stop and get gas. Couldn't you, couldn't you have <laughs> thought about it? It was premeditated. It was, it was reckless. It was deadly. It was premeditated murder. It was intentional. So John says, don't have the attitude of Cain, who was jealous of his brother's gift. And he murdered his brother. It's bad enough to murder your brother, but then the reason why he murdered him was because his works were evil and his brother's works were righteous. It says to those of us who, who walk, walk according to the Lord, we will have a day when people are jealous. We will have a day when things just don't go right. And other people won't enjoy us our, our succeeding you know there, there are some people who really really appreciate you when you're on the bus stop when they have to give you a ride they're your best friends but the moment you get your own ride the moment you don't need them anymore the moment you get your own house and the moment you get your own job Oh, she thinks she's something now. How do people do that? Somebody help me. Why? Human. Why? Human. 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 Okay. Anybody else? Why do people love you when they can do something for you and keep you down? But the moment you're able to sustain yourself, they, they walk away. Prime example is found in Mark chapter 5. There's a man running crazy in the graveyard. He's running stone crazy in the graveyard. The Bible says in Mark chapter 5, he dwelled, he lived in the graveyard. He had his dwelling in there. They said the people, the text says that the people, the men of the city tried to chain him. He broke the chain. Tried to put shackles on him. He broke the shackles. He had supernatural power. Let me tell you, the devil is able to give you supernatural power. The devil is able to give supernatural power. You don't believe me? When people get on meth, coke, alcohol, they lose their mind. They just lose it. You see, devil, the devil can't make you do wrong. But he can influence you. Will you let him influence you or will you be influenced by God? The devil wants to influence you. He, he wants to influence you to be jealous. He wants to influence you to do the unrighteous. He wants you to live a lifestyle of unrighteousness. The devil does not want you to live a righteous life. <laughs> he just wants you to Live from day to day. 
And the devil doesn't want you to live in excellence. The devil doesn't want you to, to live with progress. Look at Cain and Abel. His brother's gift was a righteous gift. Now the Bible doesn't tell us why it was righteous and why it wasn't, was, why Cain was unrighteous. But it does shine light on the fact that Cain killed his brother because he had an unrighteous gift. His works were evil. I don't think it has anything to do with one being a farmer and one being a shepherd. Because the Bible says Cain brought his offering in the process of time. Abel brought his through the first fruit. How does that apply to us today? Anybody? How does that apply to us? Process of time, first fruit. Anybody? Who's talking? Well, somebody talk. Don't wait to bring your gift to God. Don't wait to bring your gift to God. Bring it to him right away. Anybody else? How do we see ourselves, whether we're Cain or Abel here, when it comes to gifts? Paul says, lay it up for the first day of the week. Paul says, don't wait till the middle of the week. He says, lay up your offering for the first day of the week and bring it to the Lord. And be cheerful with it. It's kind of like if you're sitting in Bible study at night or you listen to Bible study at night, are you cheerful with it? Or are you just dreading? I mean, ah, Lord, I'd be glad when he's through. <laughs> Never cheerful. I, I, I had a long day anyway. You know, I, I ain't got time for this. Mm -hmm. Nobody got time for this. So we have to understand it's our attitude that, that gets approval from God. It's our mannerism. It's our innermost being that causes God to approve us and to say yes. And when we walk in faith, we are able to have a good attitude about what we do. I'm just doing this because I got to. Isn't that a shame? I'm just doing this because folk expect me to. So it's our attitude. God want us to live a righteous life with a righteous attitude and motivate. The Bible says God loves an hilarious giver. God loves somebody that's on fire for the Lord, that's going to give to the Lord and excited about it. That's why we clap when, when I say it's offering time and people go to clap. And that's why we clap. God loves a cheerful giver. Yes. The word cheerful means hilarious. Somebody that's, that's getting, getting joy out of giving. Mm -hmm. Do you get joy out of giving or you rather keep it for yourself? Nope. Nope. Do you do you give freely yep. or do people push and pump and prime you? You know, I'm, I'm so glad. I'm so happy. I'm so excited that people even give by way of zeal and, and mail in their gifts. Because no one's standing over them with a basket and they still give it. One guy told me, he said, man, the reason why I don't go to church anymore is because when the deacon pass the basket, you can give what you want. But when they stand over there and hold it and watch you, you want to give a good offering then. Is there any truth to that? At the New Beginning Church. Is there any truth to that? Okay, so since no one is holding the basket and no one is looking in your envelope, do your amount change or does your amount change? The other question is, does your amount change when they say, are we short? We need 10 more dollars. We, do we need 200 more dollars. We, do we need 500 more dollars. Who give me five? You know, I, I told a guy the first graduation, of, the first graduating class for turning hearts through evangelism. A guy got up. You know, all the pastors was up front, and the pastor got up, and and he stood up and said, "You know, I had already prayed, Lord, bless me with this certain amount of money for this graduation service." 
so we can put money back in back into the treasure. So I already prayed, and I felt like God was really going to give me what I asked. And this preacher got up, and he said, okay, who's over here will give me 100? Who's over here will give me 100? Uh, why, did I, why did I have a problem with that? Why? Why did I have a problem with that, Sister Willow? Why did I have a problem with that? I prayed, Lord, bless, and I really felt like God was going to bless me. And we fell short that day of what I had asked God for. And he was like, who will start off with 100? Who will start off with 50? Who will start off? Now, here he is asking for $100. And this is the real reason I got upset. And I told him. He put $50 in there and he was asking people for 100 mm. <laughs> Pastor, preacher. How you, I said, hey man, I had asked the Lord to do something in this room today. I had asked the Lord for a certain amount. We fell short. So you owe us $250. He knew I was dead serious. Mm. Oh no, man, don't be like that. No. You should not have done it that way. Then the Lord would have blessed the way I asked. And then when, when I looked at the envelope, he gave 50 and he asked for 100. What's wrong with that, Brother Whitlock? <laughs> he wanted somebody to help him get his 100. What's wrong with that? <laughs> he was being cheap. My question is, how are you going to ask the people to give what you're not giving. That's right. And had he given his hundred, we wouldn't have been that short. And I told him, I said, man, you owe Turning Hearts Ministry $250. Because we came up $250 short of what I asked the Lord for. And I believe that God is going to give it to us. It's all about attitude. It's all about lifestyle. It's about your practice. It's about being righteous. It's about your heart. Because tithing is a heart thing. You know that, right? <laughs> tithing off of the net or the gross. It's a heart thing. And if you are going to be selfish toward God, Malachi asked the question, will a man rob God? Yes. Then he answers the question, yes, he have, and tithes and offering. And because you rob God, you are cursed with the curse. This whole nation is cursed with the curse. In other words, blessings have been cut short because you're robbing God. Blessings. Matter of fact, not only have your blessings been cut short, you are cursed with the curse. This whole nation is cursed with the curse, said the Lord. For you have robbed God. It's your attitude. It's your, your mannerism. It's your heart. Is who you are. God is concerned about righteousness. Verse 13 he says, do not marvel my brother if the world hates you. Don't be surprised about it. Don't, don't be surprised that the world hate you. The world, the people of the world, the world, those who are unsaved. Don't get excited get turned off because people don't like you. Matter of fact, because they hate you. Don't, don't, don't be shocked. Don't marvel. Don't be astonished. Matter of fact, Jesus says, it's not that they hate you. They hate, they hate me. They hate, they hate the Father and they hate the Holy Spirit in you. It says, do not marvel. Marvel not. Do not marvel. Do not marvel, my brother, if the word hates you, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life. We've been born again. We know we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. If you got love for a brethren, for the brethren, <laughs> If you got love for the brother, you, you shouldn't have to pass the death of life. I mean, I mean people that 
don't treat you right. People that despitefully use you. People that say all manner of evil against you. If you can still love, then you pass from death to life. In other words, when we are born again, when we are saved, when we are, are converted, we pass from death to life. And because of that salvation, now we can love the brother. And it's, it's not just our family. I listen to some people pray. They're going to pray for their family every time, and that's it. They're going to pray for me, 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 me. Lord, this is me. This is I. Lord, I need you. But when you love the brother, you pray for all of them. You pray for the brother. Because you love the brother. You pass from death to life because you love the brother. He who does not love the, his brother abideth in death. If you have not passed from death to life, you're still stuck in death. If you have not passed from death to life, you're still stuck in death. In other words, you have not been converted. You have not been redeemed. But watch how he switches again. He says, you have passed from death to life. If you love your brother, you have love because you passed from death to life. If you don't love your brother, you're still dead. There used to be a movie called The Walking Dead. People on earth are walking around here, but they still dead. When I used to watch the WWE, there was a guy called The Undertaker. The Undertaker. And they would, they would throw The Undertaker down, and he, was, he would lay there like he's dead, and all of a sudden he'd sit up. The indication is he's passed from death to life. The undertaker was about almost seven feet tall. And he was, he was bursting with muscle. But you know, you know, they have to make it look good. So the undertaker would get knocked out and he lay flat on the floor. And all of a sudden, he sits up. And he sits up at the waist. He doesn't, he doesn't get up, he just sits up. The indication is that we pass from death to life. We are no longer dead. We're saved. We're born again. We are new creatures. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brother. You've heard people say, I know I'm saved because I love this person. And this person did X, Y, Z to me. I love them. He who does not love his brother abides in death. There's an indicator of your new life experience. And that indicator is love for the brother. People will know you're Christians by your love. Verse 15. This is another switch he makes. In the middle of the pericope, he switches again. Because he used the word eternal life. And he uses it where it's not contextual. He says, whoever hates the brother is a murderer. He starts off telling us what love is by telling us what love is not. Then he says to us, Whoever hates the brother is a murderer. He compares us to Cain. How many people have killed people in their hearts and their minds? I mean, you, you've already taken them out. You can, you can already see it. The Bible says you're a murderer. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. I want to open the floor for questions and comments now. Can a murderer go to heaven? Explain, please. How can it? Look, look at what it says. It says, whoever hates the brother is a murderer. 
And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Remember, this is a switch. This is a different word. This eternal life, we always say forever, right? Whosoever hates his brother is a murderer. We all agree on that, right? How many of you think that murderers go to heaven? One? What does this mean? Yeah. Let's see, two hands, three hands. What does that mean? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, anybody else? Remember, he switched it here. Can a murderer go to heaven? How many people are not sure? He can go to heaven from jail too? No, I'm saying he can't be released and then he, he has already been changed. So, look at what he says. He says, whoever hates the brother is a murderer. And you know no murderer has eternal life and abiding in him. What is he saying? If we know that murderers can go to heaven, if we know that murderers can have eternal life, is the Bible incorrect? Did John misstate? Did John misspeak? So what is he saying? How do you read this? Jesus, Jesus asked the Pharisees, how do you read? Is this not a true statement? Okay, you're not getting it, so let me read it again. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know, says you know, you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. What is he saying? Is he saying murderers can't have eternal life? What is he saying? Talk, somebody talk to me. So we all agree, or we, I think we do, that murderers can have eternal life. Yes? Mm -hmm. Maybe? Yeah. Yes? So why does the Bible say murderers, no murderer has eternal life abiding in him? Why does the Bible say this? Brother Whitlock, got the gears turning? Come on, tell them. They have no eternal life abiding in them. Okay. So I think that in order for some, in order for eternal life to this this phrase of eternal life abiding in them, he's still alive. This this individual. He's still alive. Yes. Okay. He's still being alive. It's, it's, it's a it's, it's a it's a phrase saying that for the moment while he's still a murderer. So you, can he can he lose his salvation? No. No. We we agree to that, right? Well, he he never states here whether this individual is is saved or not or repented or not. Yeah, but he says no murderer can have eternal life abiding in him, right? He said abiding in him. He didn't right. say that the murderer. Is so does that phrase make a difference? What, sure talk, tell me about this phrase then. What, why does this phrase make a difference? <laughs> why does this phrase, this, this phrase makes the difference? So why does this phrase, well, it, it's really not this phrase at all. When he uses this word eternal life here, about it in him, the word eternal life here is not the eternal life that we see when we're born again. It's talking about the eternal life that while we're walking on earth. He's saying, as Jesus says in John chapter, chapter 10, that he has come that we may have life, eternal life, and have that life more abundantly. So we don't wait till we get to heaven to have an abundant life, right? We, have a, we walk in righteousness and God blesses us because of that. God blesses everybody, the, the just and the unjust. But when, when he talks about eternal life today abiding in us, then what he's saying is we have life more abundantly. We have life to the full as we operate in righteousness. 
Brother Whitlock was on to something when he, he talks about the fact that it's abiding in him. He's, he's walking in it. Jesus says, if my branch is connected to me and I'm connected to my branch, the branch blossoms. John chapter 15. So here, this eternal life that he's talking about is the abundant life that we have here on planet Earth. And as we walk in this life on planet Earth, it becomes eternal in the fact that we have abundant life. We have life abundantly. We receive God's blessings and we recognize those blessings. Does that mean that we won't be sick? Does that mean that, that we won't die early deaths? Does that mean that we won't be involved in as an innocent bystander in a, in a, in a car accident or an innocent bystander in a shooting? Those things happen to good people. Those things happen to Christians. But it does mean that we know that we can pray to God and we can trust what God has to say. And we have this abundant life. This eternal abundant life. Eternity began before we showed up. You know that, right? There's an eternity past. There's an eternity present. And there's an eternity future. And because we're walking in eternity, once, once we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, we are already positioned in heaven. Galatians. Paul talks about in Galatians how, how we are already seated. We are already in heaven. We've been transformed down here, but we've been transitioned over there. That's why people start using the new phrase when somebody dies. They don't say, he died. What do they say now? He transitioned last night. He transitioned. That's a Christian term. It's a term meaning that he went on, and then the other term is he went on to be with the Lord. Now, we're guilty of putting everybody with the Lord. It sounds good at funerals. It sounds good. Because what we understand is people will lie on you when you're living and lie for you when you die. So we have to understand that a murderer and he just uses murderer because he's talking about Cain. But he's actually referring to any unrighteousness. Any unrighteousness is, is not of God. And at that moment, we do not abide in him. And he does not. He still, we're still saved. It's like 95% of the people on death row are saved now, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're telling you. Mm -hmm. And they, they will tell you when I... I did these awful things, then it wasn't me that did it. It's Satan that made me do it. And Satan does influence us. But the good news about the whole thing is, once we are saved, we do have eternal life from now on. So John, this is like the, the third time in this series that John has, has done this tongue twister on us and, and we have to dig deep to understand what he's saying because whosoever hates his brother is a murderer. If you hate him, you're a murderer. You got to love. So he talks about living righteous, and then he talks about loving people. It is Jesus' culture. It is the culture of Jesus Christ to love people. To love people. To, to express love. To look forward to showing love. Even a person that gets on your nerve. Even a stranger. We ought to look forward to showing love. And that's what Jesus did for us on Calvary. He died, he was buried, he rose from the dead because he really, really loved us. He gave us his only life because he loves us. And because Jesus loves us, he died for us. It was a voluntary death. He voluntarily gave his life for us. No man took his life. He laid his life down for us. He died in spirit, and early that third day morning, he rose from the dead. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. I submit to you, try Jesus.
trust him, he will make a way out of no way. Try Jesus. Believe the story that he died for your sins. He's buried in a borrowed tomb and rose from the dead. And, and this same Jesus can, can make your life righteous. This same Jesus can make you over again. If you trust Jesus as your Savior, you want to trust him as your Savior, just bow your head with me and repeat after me and invite him into your life. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We believe that you honestly believe the story and invited Christ into your life. We believe that you're born again. We believe that you're on your way to heaven when you die. If you're looking for a church home or you're in between church home, I recommend the New Beginning Church where Jesus is the captain of the ship. Please inbox us and let us know that you want to join our church and we'll be glad to rejoice with you. If you receive Christ tonight, please let us know so we can celebrate your brand new life in Christ, this new eternal life in Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service. It is offering time. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offerings, and sacrificial gifts. God, God wants you to be a hilarious giver, a cheerful giver. God wants you to be an excited giver. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you for another privilege to give. We ask you to bless every giver. Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Yeah. If you need an envelope, raise your hand and you will be served. If you need an envelope. If you want to give electronically, you can do so by giving by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Or you can mail in your gifts to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459.
We need to pray for the Joe Lewis family. Joe Lewis, Joe Lewis passed away or transitioned. Uh, transition, so we need to pray for the Joe Lewis family. Uh, lift that family in prayer. We want to make sure we pray for his family and, and his friends. Why don't we stand to be dismissed? Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. God, we thank you for First John. We thank you for chapter 3. We thank you, Father God, for verses 10 through 15. We ask you to bless us. Bless it to be a part of our lives, that our lives will be moved in such a way that we will have a godly condition, a godly attitude, a godly righteousness. And bless us to have love for one another. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, unto him be power, be glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let's sing together. Amen. God bless you. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. God bless you. God keep you. You are dismissed.